Having been born, we attach importance to the passing days, months, and years. We believe in the importance of our lives and the lives of others. For that reason, our minds are constantly concerned with pain and suffering. Moonstone Pearls Beginning in the ninth century, the migration of the Dai people from southern China progressed as steadily and quietly as the flow of monsoon floodwaters that seep into dense forests and blanket fertile plains, changing color with the hue of the sky and form with the contour of the land. Woven together geographically, Dai ethnic groups of common origins and similar culture spread over mountains and down valleys from south China into ancient Siam. Among the many Thai subgroups were the Pu Thai people, who were fiercely independent farmers and hunters. Originating from the Chinese prefecture of Jiao Di on the banks of the Red River, they were driven by a succession of political upheavals to forge their way south through the neighboring Lao kingdoms, gradually pushed further with each generation until they reached the banks of the Mekong River. They settled inland and remained there for centuries, migrating later to more fertile land on the river's opposite side and fanning out along its western territories. Over centuries of struggle and hardship, through droughts, floods, natural disasters, and communal tragedies, the resourceful Pudai people were eventually united into a cohesive political entity ruled by a hereditary local lord and a powerful clan of warriors and administrators. The kingdom of Muktahan, named for the moonstone pearls or Mukta, which the Putai discovered in local stream beds, became a regional center for their traditional way of life. Ban Hui Sai was a small Putai farming community in the Kam Chai district of Old Siam's Muktahan province. Situated at the far edge of the Mekong River floodplain, where the southern range of the Pupan Mountains rise to form a rolling landscape, the village perched neatly on a smooth stretch of high ground between the Hui Bang Sai and Hui Bang Yi rivers. It was a settlement of rustic wooden houses, built on stilts and shaded by large overhanging trees, as though the living space had been carved out of a dense primeval forest. The villagers were country people, with rough, unrefined manners and simple, guileless lives, sustained by subsistence farming and the hunting of wild game. They cultivated rice, each family farming a plot of fertile land on the village outskirts that had been cleared of trees. Beyond the clearing lay a thick jungle terrain, Teeming with tigers and elephants, this vast forest was believed to harbor hidden dangers and frightening places, compelling the inhabitants to band together in village settlements for safety and companionship. Situated over a large expanse of fertile territory along the Mekong, Muktahan began as a separate kingdom and later evolved into a semi-autonomous principality, owing allegiance to Siam's Chakri dynasty. Legend has it that Ban Hui Sai village was once home to three royal sisters, Princess Gao, Princess Glum, and Princess Ga, who, through the female line, stamped a lasting imprint on the Pu Dai character. By the force of their personalities, they instilled in generations of offspring a sharp intellect, an implacable determination, and a fair-minded viewpoint. Proud of their heritage and independent in spirit, the Pu Dai were unified by the bonds of tradition, custom, and language. These bonds were passed down like sacred trusts from one generation to the next. In late 19th century Siam, the local magistrate of Ban Hui Sai village was Tasson Sianglum. Tasson's authority came from Zhao Meong, the provincial lord who had appointed him. His responsibilities were to mediate local disputes, moderate local tempers, and engage his fellow Putai's innate sense of justice in order to preserve neighborly peace and harmony. Magistrate Tasson was a fair-minded man of simple wisdom who resolved to serve his people well. By maintaining communal peace, he was doing his part to maintain the traditional Putai identity. His wife, Don, was a gentle and kind woman who carried the title of magistrate as well, but had no public duties as such. Instead, she raised a family of five children. The oldest three were boys, followed in quick succession by two girls. The youngest was born early on the morning of November 8, 1901. Her mother named her Tabai, which meant eye-catching. From an early age, Tabai had an aura of mystery about her, as though she knew more than she could ever express. When she was old enough to speak, she giggled with delight as she whispered to her mother about nocturnal adventures in which she accompanied glowing globes of light to wondrous places, places she could describe only with gestures and not with words. 
Many years later, after she became a Buddhist nun, she would recount how she grew up befriended by celestial playmates, devas of the heavenly spheres whose radiant forms only she could see. They had been her spiritual companions in countless past lives, and they worried that her spirit might succumb to the attractions of physical embodiment. To prevent her spirit from becoming anchored in the earthly plane, the day was often enticed by to separate herself from her physical body, to tour the spiritual realm of celestial abodes with them. Tapai's father and mother were both devout Buddhists who showed enlightened tendencies. For instance, they maintained a respectful distance from the practice of spirit worship that was common in Putai culture. The family lived just behind the village temple, their property located along the bamboo fence which enclosed the temple compound, so close that the big mango tree shading the temple's perimeter dropped ripe fruit into Tapai's family yard each summer. In this surrounding, Tapai grew up attuned to the mellow sounds of chanting, morning and evening, and acquainted with the daily rhythms of monastic life. Already as a child, she learned to focus her mind by concentrating on the monk's soft, mesmerizing cadence until it resonated inside her heart. She was thrilled by the excitement of festival days that punctuated the Buddhist calendar year, when the whole village gathered to celebrate in the temple fairgrounds behind her house. Tapai observed how her father treated the monks with great respect. It was not the kind of tense, guarded respect he showed to high-ranking officials. It was, instead, a natural, open deference, full of warmth and devotion. Each morning, after Tapai and her mother placed their offerings of sticky rice and curries wrapped in banana leaf, into the monk's alms bowls, her father followed the monks to the edge of the village. Tasson always kept a respectful distance as the monks received their daily offerings and helped carry the food-laden bowls back to the temple. On the four religious observance days of each month, the days of the new and full moons and the two days of the half moon, Tasson scrupulously maintained the precepts while enjoying the luxury of spending a whole day at the temple, chatting and doing odd jobs for the monks. As a young child, Tapai's life energy moved freely between her physical world and her spiritual world. Then, suddenly, when she was five years old, both worlds collapsed. Without thought or warning, before the possibility ever crossed her mind or entered her imagination, her mother fell ill and died. In her shock and confusion, everything she believed in crumbled and fell apart. At the simple funeral ceremony, Tapai stared on, gripped by fear at seeing her mother's cold, stiff body, wrapped in layers of white cloth, lying atop a crude pyre of logs and branches. When the flames leapt up and tore through the cloth and skin to expose raw, blistering flesh and twisted sinews, she turned her head away in pain. Even as the fire finally came to rest, and all that remained were ashes and charred bones, she still could not bear to look. With her mother's death, Tapai learned at an early age that change and loss are part of life, that life is inseparable from pain and death. Gradually, with the help of her family, especially her two brothers, Pon and Pin, she began to heal. The boys loved their sister, she with her bright eyes and strong will. Although they too were in pain over the loss of their mother, the brothers constantly tried to cheer Tapai up and lighten her mood. Finally, however, it was a new closer, more personal relationship with her father that ultimately lifted her heart and cleared away the burden of grief. After his wife's death, Tasson began taking Tapai to the temple on lunar observance days. She sat with her father for hours, watching, listening, daydreaming, but most of all, healing. She grew so fond of the temple atmosphere that whenever she had free time, she liked to sneak into the grounds, sit beneath the mango tree, and do nothing but enjoy a sense of calm. Tapai liked to celebrate Visaka Puja, the May festival honoring the Buddha's birth, enlightenment, and passing away. May in Banhui Sai village was one of the most beautiful months of the year. With the first showers of the annual rains, flowers burst into bloom, bringing small explosions of color everywhere and armloads of blossoms for offerings at the festival. Flowers were gathered in abundance and placed lovingly around the radiant shrine of the Buddha with its multi-tiered altar. In the evening, a candlelit procession of monks and laity would wind its way around the ordination hall, after which the monks led the entire congregation in chanting ancient verses of praise for the Lord Buddha and his teaching. The chants were deeply inspiring, 
and so moving that they lifted the participants from the commonplace of daily existence to a higher, more exalted plane. As the spiritual bond between father and daughter deepened, Tapai began, hesitantly at first, to tell him about her other world, her inner world of mystery and surprise. Tasson listened patiently, quizzically, to tales of playful deities in dream-world escapades, flights of fantasy which he tolerated, but to which he was careful to lend no credence. Then, at age seven, Tapai started to experience vivid recollections of her past lives, both human and non-human. Innocently and eagerly, she described to her father the lifetimes she had recalled, spontaneously, as if from a vision. The life of a chicken, a doctor, a princess, a commoner. Tapai's father had never been pleased with her clairvoyance, and his growing disapproval showed. His mood shifted dramatically. His complexion darkened, and a new note, a threatening tone, entered his voice. He warned her, at first gently and then later more sternly, not to mention these visions to anyone. Otherwise, she would risk being labeled crazy, or worse. He worried that such a stigma might become irrevocably attached to her as she grew up in that small rural community. Gradually, Tapai adjusted to her new family situation by assuming the traditional responsibilities of a woman's work. With her older sister, Tapai shared the burden of housekeeping. Being the stronger and more willful of the two, Tapai resolved to perfect the countless little chores that she had seen her mother perform so gracefully. Somebody had to rise early to kindle the fire and steam the family's daily rice. Somebody was needed to set out the meal, wash the pots, and put away the saucers. There was sweeping, scrubbing, and washing to be done, cotton to be spun, cloth to be woven, and clothes to be mended. Brooms were handcrafted, and so were an assortment of baskets, woven bamboo ones for packing sticky rice, and plated rattan ones for collecting wild mushrooms and forest greens. Training her body resolutely to adapt to its new tasks, Tabai became adept in all these numerous duties at a young age. Each chore, each handicraft required special skill and hours of tedious practice to master. When she wasn't practicing these tasks at home, she was working in the rice fields or the adjacent forests, acquiring other skills. Her mother used to take her on excursions into the surrounding hills to pick wild herbs and forest greens or to fish in the outlying ponds. Now she went with her aunts and cousins, learning how to distinguish edible mushrooms from poisonous ones, the sweet herbs from the bitter. Whether it was planting, harvesting, or simply gathering, food was always a daily concern. Rice, the sticky, glutinous variety that was the Pu Thai staple, held a steady and inescapable sway over the villagers, influencing the tenor of their lives. In anticipation of the annual rains, farmers sprouted seedlings in small plots of land, while their water buffaloes plowed the fields. When the rains finally came and saturated the ground with sufficient downpours, the fields were trampled by the buffaloes into coarse mud, creating a rich bog for planting the rice sprouts. Then, groups of women, bent at the waist and walking backwards, grabbed handfuls of young seedlings to thrust in small bunches into the thick mud, planting several strands at a time while trying to keep the rows straight. Rice farming was exhausting labor but it created close-knit village communities. After Tabai's mother died, all the women in her extended family worked together during the planting season to cultivate her father's fields. While she was still too young to do hard labor, Tabai often stood on the embankment under gray skies and watched the women sloshing through the wet, soft earth, eager for the day when she would take her place alongside them. After several years and a respectable interval of mourning, Tabai's father remarried. His new bride was a young widow whose husband had died in one of the epidemics that periodically disrupted the regularity of village existence, adding another layer of hardship to an already harsh life. Tapai liked her stepmother. They enjoyed each other's company immediately, and Tapai gained a new companion in the woman's young daughter. It felt like a new beginning, and Tapai was happy again. She met every situation with a ready smile and the hardships of rural life seemed to evaporate in the presence of her bright and cheerful demeanor. But when her baby half-brother died shortly after birth, Tapai felt the pain of loss and grieved once more. She experienced again the bitter truth of impermanence, knowledge that she seemed destined to learn in her world of constant change and loss. She saw that the world around her fell apart only to renew itself every day and with every season. 
Change was such a persistent fact of life that parting became simply an ordinary part of living. Putai villagers led hard lives. Women's work was endless, cooking, washing, sewing, weaving, and sowing and harvesting the rice crop, year in and year out. It helped to buy that she got along well with her stepmother. They developed a close working relationship, sharing heavy work and light-hearted moments with equal good humor. Tapai found help of other kinds as well. Without a local school, Tapai could not get formal education. She found, instead, that her home, the rice fields, and the wild forests were her school. In these places, she received instruction that can only be seen as enduring and essential in life. Lessons in love, renunciation, change, and patience. Lessons in disappointment and determination. And lessons in suffering and equanimity. With this schooling, her childhood education progressed year upon year.